Flooding is a fairly regular occurrence in these Appalachian Mountains. Most recently, the unprecedented flooding that happened along the Virginia-Kentucky border last year. Now, those floods that happen in coal country can be made worse by the practices of the coal companies, as you'll hear in today's story. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gelly, along with Rod Mullins, and this is another one of the stories of Appalachia. Well, Steve, this story kind of hits home with me, the story that we're getting ready to talk about because it involves a coal company that my father used to work for and some of my other relatives used to work for. But this was one of those stories that really you you were left scratching your head at wondering why did this have to happen? And it is just it is so uh, moving. It's so shocking to hear all of this stuff that happened and then to – you know, the end result before it was all over with. But we're going to tell everybody about that. But this is this is just one of those stories. It's heartbreaking. No, no other way to say it. It's heartbreaking, and it's another one of those examples of the way that I feel a lot of coal companies came in here. They raped the land, and they also raped the people for everything they could get out of them. And then what did they do? Walk away, and they would made money out of it. Yeah, yeah, terrible disaster, and... Unlike what happened last year over in Kentucky and Southwest Virginia, this was not preordained. It Mm -hmm. was man-made in a lot of ways, yeah. Well, coal mining has been the lifeblood of Appalachia for over 100 years. And along with coal mining comes a lot of waste. Rock, dirt, minerals, toxic leftovers from the processing of coal, all of which is known as sludge or gob. And what do you do with gob? Well, nowadays, there are regulations covering that. But years ago, the coal companies would just, well, pile it up somewhere that was handy at the moment. Where company officials chose to place the gob from the mines of the Buffalo Mining Company in West Virginia caused what happened in that area to go down in Appalachian history as one of the worst disasters to ever occur. Buffalo Creek is a tributary of the Tug Fork, which runs partly through Logan County, West Virginia. There it divides into several branches, and it was on the Middle Fork branch that our story takes place. The Middle Fork of Buffalo Creek runs for more than 20 miles through a holler, or a hollow if you want to call it that, along which stood 17 little towns. Also, there was a huge deposit of coal. In 1945, the Laredo Coal Mining Company opened mine number five at the head of Buffalo Holla, near Saunders, West Virginia. Now, almost immediately, the company began dumping sludge at the mouth of the Middle Fork, creating a dam across the creek. The Buffalo Mining Company bought out Laredo in 1964 and then proceeded to start dumping gob behind the first dam so as to make a pond between the two dams. And they continued to dump through 1967 when a partial failure of the original sludge dam brought it to the state of West Virginia's attention, resulting in a citation in 1971, but not much of anything else. Simply a slap on the wrist. In 1970, Pittston Coal bought out the Buffalo Mining Company and promptly began building a third sludge dam behind the first two, resulting in two ponds, which Pittston then used as settling ponds for a coal processing plant that they'd built nearby. The cleaning of the coal into the settling ponds resulted in two ponds covered by a thick goo consisting of millions of tons of coal waste and hazardous minerals, which acted much like quicksand, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And that gets us to February 1972. Now, that month was a very wet month in Appalachia. It had been a snowy winter, and recent rains caused the creeks and rivers in and around Logan County to rise. You see these uh, gob dams? They weren't engineered. They had no safety features, nor was there a simple drainage ditch to allow excess water out at a reasonable pace so as not to overwhelm the Middle Fork. And to top it off, Pittston continued to pump cleaning water and sludge into the creek as they cleaned the coal that came out of the mines at the rate of half a million gallons a day. By the time night fell on February 25th, Pittston officials finally realized what they had on their hands. They sent out a feeble warning to a few families in the holler, but no widespread alarms were raised, so most folks who actually heard it just ignored it. Well, that night, dam number three began to show the strain of holding back all that water, muck, poison, gob, whatever you want to call it, and Pitson finally sent for a bulldozer. 
to carve out a drainage ditch to relieve the pressure, but it was all too late. Just prior to 8 o'clock a.m. on February 26th, bulldozer operator Denny Gibson discovered the water had risen to the crest of the impoundment and the dam was, quote, real soggy, end quote. Dam number three failed first, following heavy rains and causing the failure of the second, then the first dam sending a wall of black death down the Buffalo Hollow. People had no idea what was coming as the water and the sludge flew down the valley, carving out a 45-foot deep canyon as it passed. A resident of the town of Amherstdale commented that before the water reached her town, there was a cold stillness. There was no words, no dogs, no nothing. It felt like you could reach out and slice the stillness. What a quote right there. You could reach out and slice the stillness. Well, another comment on the rushing tide, quote, this water, when it came down through here, it acted real funny. It would go this way on the side of the hill and then take out a house and then take one house of all the rows and then go back the other way. It would just go from one hillside to the other, end quote. In the end, 17 communities were devastated. Houses demolished and the few left standing were so contaminated that they had to be destroyed as uninhabitable. 123 people were killed in the flood, 1,000 injured, and 4,000 left homeless. And this all between 7.59 and 11 o'clock that morning. 120 million gallons of water and 35 million gallons of sludge and other waste materials were rushed through and covered the hauler. Not only that, but farther down the creek, the coal company placed their yellow sulfur coal waste deposits, the sulfur being the waste from the coal that was mined. And sulfur has a very deadly property. When it comes into contact with water, it catches fire. And once that flood water muck hit the sulfur waste, there was a massive explosion. Then what was left was carried down the valley with the flood, a burning flood. When it was all over, officials at Pittston Coal came out with a statement that the flood was, quote, an act of God, end quote, and they weren't responsible for the damages caused by that flood. Excuse me while I cough for a moment on that quote. <coughs> okay. I could have said something a lot worse, <laughs> but I won't. Governor Arch Moore set up a governor's ad hoc commission of inquiry to investigate. But immediately, it was met with controversy when it was discovered that the commission was made up entirely of members sympathetic to the coal industry. United Mine Workers of America President Arnold Miller requested that a coal miner be added to the commission, but was denied. And with that, public outrage boiled over. If the people couldn't be on the governor's commission, then maybe it was time to form a people's commission. And that's just what happened. The Citizens Commission to investigate the Buffalo Creek disaster was organized, made up of local residents, and they were determined, bound and determined, to get answers from the West Virginia government. The Citizens Commission strongly disagreed with Pittston's position that the flood was, that quote, an act of God, arguing that the dams were not properly engineered and that Pittston should be held fully liable for the damage. After thorough investigation, the commission eventually made 21 recommendations to the state, and the most important of which were penalizing Pittston for pollution and unsafe mining practices, urging residents to demand actual warning systems and to research whether or not there were any remaining dangers, prosecuting Pittston for criminal negligence, suing Pittston for damages to bridges and roads, and outlawing strip mining in West Virginia. Now, West Virginia did sue Pittston for $100 million in disaster and relief damages, but three days before he left office in 1977, Governor Moore settled that pending lawsuit for $1 million, 1% of what they asked. A Washington, D.C. law firm filed a civil suit against Pittston in 1972 on behalf of the residents of the Hala, settling the case for $13.5 million in June 1974. Now, Arch Moore ran again for governor and won in 1984, serving from 1985 to 1989, 
He was later charged with five felony charges related to his time in office and sentenced to five years and ten months in prison, serving over three years before being paroled. He was also disbarred and forfeited his state pension and paid a $750,000 settlement to the state of West Virginia. Well, in 1973, the West Virginia legislature passed the Dam Control Act. Now, I'm saying that seriously here. Regulating all dams in the state. However, funding was never appropriated to enforce the law. In 1992, an official with the State Division of Natural Resources estimated that there were at least 400 hazardous non-coal dams in West Virginia, many of which were owned by the state. Now, a study found that 17 years later, the residents of Buffalo Creek scored higher on a measure of trait anxiety in comparison to the residents of a nearby coal town that did not experience the flood. And Steve, I think, you know, that really stands out right there. This reminds me a little bit of one of the other podcasts that we did about the, I think it was the Christmas Eve sort of thing that happened in Saltville and, and yeah. so forth. But this was really devastating to West Virginia. But, you know, there are some people right now that are going and taking care of these gob ponds or these gob dams is what they're doing. And they're going in there and they're taking this stuff. And as a matter of fact, not far from me, they are actually taking what that gob is and they're taking it out and they are taking it to a power station over at Virginia City and they are burning gob in order to use up that leftover of stuff that didn't get processed the first time around. It's a really ambitious thing and they end up returning the land back with the reclamation back to almost an incredible way, the way that they've done some some good at this. And I know a couple of people that did this that went into business, they left the company that they were involved in for so long, and they went to work doing this, and they've done a fantastic job. But, you know, there's just so much you can do. And, you know, it's these places are pretty much strewn all over Appalachia. Well, and you'd think with all the things that are in those gob ponds, in terms of, chemicals and things like mm -hmm. that, that there right. ought to be something in there that would be valuable to somebody that you could process mm -hmm. into a product, you know, not just yep. burn it, but process it into something that people could actually use. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the one thing about it. Uh, you know, I wish there was, and, you know, they talked about at one time, this thing of, uh, if the coal business actually did go belly up before it was over with, what would we do? And I'm trying to remember what the, uh, what the name or the formal title was, but it was um, elements, certain things about coal that's found in coal that can be used in medical equipment, things of that nature. Know. But you don't really hear anything about it. You just hear some people talking and saying, we'd like to do this, but we haven't got to this. Instead, we're discussing what to do with old mines and putting nuclear reactors, you know, little small nuclear reactors on already disturbed land or, you know, they're close to a mine and so forth. And it kind of, kind of gets scary. And also drop this name too. We talked about Arch Moore. His daughter went into politics and you know who mm -hmm, we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah. Chili Moore Capito. Yeah. Yeah. And she is right now, she is one of the two senators from West Virginia, the other being Joe Manchin. And pretty much they go and they stand up for West Virginia for whatever they can do and so forth. But her father, with this legacy and stuff, $100 million and then only settling for 1% of the, of the actual amount for $1 million, it's just atrocious. It just it makes me sick when I hear that. And folks, that's the story of the Buffalo Creek Flood. Another one of the stories that make up the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. The Stories Podcast can be found at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Audible, or on your own favorite podcast app. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Story Appalachia, and on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok at Stories of Appalachia. Thanks for lending us your ears, folks. Until next time, y'all take care. So long, everybody.